My name is Jeff. I am the president of the club that's hosting the conference this weekend. So yeah. I thank you guys a lot for coming out. We really appreciate it. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Mr. Bob Fenner. Thank you very much. As Jeff, uh, Jeff says, uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, be able to come out and share with you. Uh, this talk is about the butterfly fishes and their use in marine aquariums. This is a wet web media. If you want to see this talk again, or presentation, or the references uh, uh, where I lifted the information from, it is posted on our site. That's wet web media, not wet media, that's a porn site. They, 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 they actually make money. So. So butterfly fishes, people are probably pretty familiar with them. Uh, uh, a beautiful group of animals, markings, colors-wise, and even behavior, uh, named uh, after the namesake of uh, the insects, the lepidopterans. And so the part of the uh, audience participation here, how many people actually kept butterfly fishes in their system? Hold not just your hands up, but if you've had more than one specimen, if you would like hold up the number of fingers. If you had a whole bunch, you can take your shoes off <laughs> one way or the other. A lot, and while your hands are still up, may I ask you, keep your hand up, if yours lived more than three months. And if some of them died, just the one finger or two fingers, whatever, the ones that lived. You have ones that lived more than three months? How many people only had ones that lived for less than three months, but more than one month? There we go. And how many people had them live less than one month? Yeah, a few. So, so uh, what to tell you? Uh, the butterfly fishes are very popular. Uh, they're ranked amongst the top five uh, families of marine fishes uh, in terms of their use in the aquarium hobby. And uh, there's a, 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 a scientist, Elizabeth Wood, who accumulated data uh, from people's uh, invoices of shipping uh, ornamental aquatics uh, out of countries, mainly to the U.S., and she recorded uh, 72 of the currently described 130 species of butterfly fishes between these dates, this 14 years, about 350,000 specimens. But uh, the trade usually is uh, underrepresented in such numbers. The people are cheating to avoid uh, paying the, the taxes on uh, selling more animals. So uh, there's uh, likely many, many more butterfly fishes that were shipped. And in terms of uh, value, uh, a study uh, recorded here is Charlie Delbeek in the audience. I want to give him credit uh, from uh, a compilation of uh, scientific papers in 2013. Uh, in Hong Kong, two of the three uh, uh, groups of uh, fishes that were sold for more than $1,000 each were butterfly fishes. So some of them are high dollar items. And so why don't more people keep butterflies? How come this isn't the you know, uh, butterfly uh, uh, aquarium uh, collectors in North America uh, get together? The, they die uh, pretty easily, some of them do. And as you'll see in the course of this talk, the reason they die is uh, pretty easily explained. Uh, about half of them, unfortunately, are obligate coralivores. What does that mean? They only eat, they only eat live coral polyps. So those, uh, likewise, most people aren't very happy about that. And some of them eat a whole bunch. The ones that just eat uh, live coral, they may eat up to 50 grams. And there's about 28 grams in an ounce. So close to two ounces of live coral polyps, wet weight, per day. So it wouldn't take long in a small system for them to strip a lot of your uh, corals. Also, uh, they uh, have a reputation of uh, being poor shippers. They die in transit. But again, uh, you'll come to understand uh, why that's the case. Uh, they're not fed after they're collected uh, until after they're shipped. And sometimes there's several days that go by before they uh, actually are moved. And so, uh, as I say, not to despair, you'll see that there's uh, ways that uh, mortality can be easily reduced. Uh, through uh, better handling and uh, proper shipping. And uh, anyway, whether they are coral polyp eaters or not, uh, many of the public aquariums keep them 
with live corals and have kept them f sometimes for decades. And here's some of the references to that effect. Uh, if uh, Charlie Delbeek is here, he worked at the Waikiki Aquarium. Uh, there have been some uh, butterfly fishes that have been kept, especially in European aquariums, public aquariums, for more than 25 years. So even the super difficult species have been kept. So everybody knows that folks want to uh, uh, pronounce the names of uh, the things that they're involved in. Uh, the ketodonidae, the butterfly fishes. Keto means, uh, you know, bristle, like a bristle on a, on a brush, and an orthodontist, that sort of thing. Uh, teeth, uh, so bristle-like teeth. And uh, they use this uh, 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 pro uh, pronathism, the forward-facing uh, jaws, and those prizing teeth to extricate uh, small invertebrates, what have you, mainly from between a coral or snatch them out of the water column. As I mentioned, and actually Luis Rocha mentioned, there are currently 130 species of butterflies, but there's, I, I would guess, about twice that many if folks start collecting them from the mesophotic zone uh, and actually just other parts of the world. All of the world's oceans including just in the tropics, have not been studied. Mainly just studied around, of course, where there's international airports, electricity, Wi-Fi, uh, what have you. And butterflies, they're laterally compressed, you know, side to side like a pancake, uh, basically shaped like the palm of your hand. They have large eyes that are, uh, because they're always prizing food items, that are located, uh, located anteriorly on the body. And I hope you can make this out. This is uh, the distribution of butterflies around the world. Uh, you can see uh, they're broadly uh, tropical. Uh, most species are from the Indo-West Pacific, uh, but of course they are found uh, in the Atlantic, uh, tropical West Atlantic as well as the Eastern Atlantic a little bit. Most of them are found in shallow water, like diving, uh, scuba diving depths. Is there many people here scuba divers? Show of hands. Oh, that's great. Used to be very few people that they crossed over from the poverty, which is keeping aquariums, to the super poverty, which is uh, dive travel. So, uh, but some of the more expensive uh, butterflies are found in, uh, notably in deeper water, and they do go down to six, seven, eight hundred feet. And size wise, some of the small butterflies, the Pronothodes, they only get about three inches overall length. And then this one, I love this name. Uh, some people call this the line butterfly, but uh, in the sciences we call it the pig nose butterfly. And for folks who've been to Hawaii, this is somebody feeding a sea urchin to uh, a couple of pig nose butterflies in Ka'alu Beach. Where is Dana? Dana, there we are. It's very close by your house. I think you know. And so the troubles that people have with keeping uh, ketodonids in captivity are mainly user-friendly or user-unfriendly uh, issues that they bring on themselves. Uh, again, I mentioned the business of how they're collected uh, and uh, kept initially in captivity. Uh, they usually the collectors will keep them for uh, uh, the ease of uh, re-netting them in small cubicles, little containers of a gallon or two, and the animals end up damaging their rostrums, their noses. And then they give up feeding, have subsequent issues with a lack of nutrition, what have you. And beyond those issues, if they live past the point of collection and shipment to wholesalers, uh, people uh, make simple errors of putting them in uh, inappropriate environments with especially uh, too aggressive tank mates. And some butterflies really have a long snout, and so they're called long snout. Uh, butterflies. Uh, again, you can just imagine when these things are collected, uh, how easy it would be for the beak, the, the, the rostrum, to get damaged. And so now, I'm, this is part of the greatest story ever told. This is my chance, even though my background actually was, of course, in the sciences. Then I was in the pet fish industry for, okay, half a century. And, uh, you know, now I still love it and uh, try to get out and uh, share what little I've learned. 
uh, with other people. Uh, this is one of the problems that's wrong with butterflies. The people mostly in the trade have learned that when you put the fish in a bag with the water, maybe it's double bag, maybe it has a liner in case the inner bag gets punctured, to lay the bag on its side. There's the people who've been scuba diving, many of you raised your hand, if the same number of people have been diving at nighttime, at nighttime, you may notice what are many of the fishes doing? They're sitting on the bottom, right? Many tropical reef fishes, that's what they do at nighttime. The same is in your aquarium, if there's, not, if there's not a whole bunch of light. So by laying the bag on the side when you're shipping the fish, the fish actually go to sleep. So instead of struggling, possibly poking the bag, damaging their face by running into the side, they actually go to sleep. And if you can especially, and many of the people here are from in places with inclement weather, if you have a specialized uh, uh, esky or uh, what do you guys call a cooler that you usually move your fish in to keep them in the dark, in addition to laying the bag on the side, very, very helpful. So even though like the people in the trade, what are we paying for when we ship the things? Space and weight. So they want to get as many animals as possible in the box, in the cargo container, and with as little water as possible. But even considering the same amount of water, the same amount of oxygen, laying the bag on the side has a decidedly positive impact on survivability. So anyway, if you go to your fish store, or many of you are in the trade but don't want to admit it, uh, you, will, uh, you will have the animals stay much healthier if you ship them on their side. And not just butterflies, by the way. The folks who lost their butterflies earlier or later, most of the early losses have something to do with the lack of nutrition. They don't maybe be eating, but is it getting enough outright nutrition to stay alive? Uh, and uh, the other source of losses are mainly what we would call mysterious or anomalous losses. You just get up in the morning and take a look and your butterfly's dead one way or the other. But the problems with the hunger strike, this is, this is very, very common. And it mainly starts with the people when they collect the fish. As I mentioned, they're going to ship the fish within usually a few more days' time. And so what do they do? They don't feed the fish because you don't want the fish uh, going to the bathroom, defecating, uh, uh, excreting, and secreting a great deal of uh, ammonia, which is their form of urine, uh, in the bag because it will poison. Uh, the fish. So the way to reduce that amount of waste material, you just don't feed them. But unfortunately, a lot of the fishes we like to keep as pet fish, when you're out diving, what do you see them doing? They're swimming around during the daylight hours, picking at the substrate, looking for food items, and eating one way or the other. So nothing to eat, what are they going to do? They pick on each other, they worry uh, one way or the other. So it does uh, uh, create problems. But anyway, just to let you know, once your dealer, whether you're in the business or you get them from a wholesaler, whether you're the end user, the consumer, a hobbyist, and buying them from a LFS, a fish store, you should be aware that the animals, when they're first received, probably have not been fed for quite a while. And so all, I know most of this has ended in the U.S., but there are still some places that have midnight madness sales. Well, that sounds pretty good. And so... Uh, they want to sell you the animal straight out of the bag right when they get it. Not such a good idea. The animals are already tired, beat, probably have not been fed for ages. Better for you to leave them at the shop for a good week or two. And if it's a valuable specimen or they only got one in and you must have it, you must, then uh, put a deposit down and leave it there. And then the issue uh, of a of inappropriate environment, uh, these animals really need a great deal of room. It's a friend of mine, uh, Scott Michael, he says if you have the smaller species, about 280 liters, there's a, a pretty close to 170 gallons, would be about the smallest system he would put them in. And the larger species, about 380 liters. And myself, I just, because we're Americans, I say how many football field equivalents is about 200 gallons, really, is a, a minimum size I would put butterflies in. And for the big species, 300 gallons. It's pretty big. And they need more than just the space. If you see the animals in the wild and you approach them, 
if you wait long enough, you're trying to be a photographer, they'll come back out of the rocks and what have you. But initially, in an aquarium, they want to uh, run and hide, so you want to be providing that sort of habitat. Oops. And then uh, another category, the last category of uh, induced problems, placing uh, butterflies with uh, inappropriate tank mates. And these are the usual uh, suspects, things like large basses, trigger fishes, uh, eels, uh, big puffers, big grasses, this sort of things that will not just outcompete the butterfly, but may actually be picking on it. And how are you going to be able to tell any or all of this is going on? For one, of course, the ideal would be to, to place the butterfly early in your uh, stocking assortment. But if it has to go in to an already established system, to introduce it at nighttime, to, to move some of the habitat around so everybody is disoriented, to feed the other animals, and to do what? Turn the lights off. And thus far, even though butterfly fishes have been uh, bred through uh, hormonal manipulation in captivity, most of them are uh, all wild collected. There are some post-settled larval ones they collect in Polynesia and then raise them up. And those have been shipped to Europe and trained to eat flake food pellets, what have you, even though they only eat corals in the wild. So when people finally get around to being able to raise uh, butterfly fishes in captivity economically, uh, you will see the things being able to be kept in any sort of system, probably with uh, 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 any types of foods being taken eagerly. Here's a cell I lifted from another talk about what a fence net is like, just in case when you tell people, well, this thing's, they're caught in a fence or barrier nets, not with poisons, not with spears, of course, uh, what have you, not with simple hand nets. And what this is, is a barrier or a fence. It's flexible. It has a float line here at the top with corks and a lead line that stays on the bottom. And what you do, you go down in an area that you think is propitious and you look around and you see lots of uh, dollars swimming around. They're fishes, but they're dollar equivalents. And so you're thinking, oh boy, I'm getting the Mercedes. Now I'm going to collect these fishes. Well, what, do you just set the net around them? No, you actually force them off their property. You get down there, you usually have chaser poles. The poor people in the world sometimes use a little piece of rebar. We, we are fancy in the West, we use uh, 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 nylon rods that we tap on the bottom and scare the fish off the reef. And then we set this net and guess where the fish are gonna go? They're gonna come back. They have no other place to go. This is where they live. Even though some butterflies have areas that they feed on and move around that are more than 100 uh, square meters, they really will come back to about the same place. Also, this is the same with the wrasses and tangs, what have you. So after they come back, you go around behind them and chase them into the barrier net, into the fence net, and then you take your hand net out of your weight belt and catch them off the fence net. And you go, don't they, aren't they smarter than that? Why don't they swim over the top or swim underneath? No, they're reef associated. They stay near the bottom. Because they've learned if they go up off the bottom, what happens? Mr. Shark or Mr. Tuna or somebody comes by and eats you. And they, they're not smart enough to dig underneath unless they're wrasses, what have you. So the long and short of it though, this is the basics of how over 95% of all tropical marine fishes are collected. Oh, and some small percent of butterfly fishes, in particular in Hawaii, are collected by hand. But the ones that are collected by hand, they're mainly collected for institutions like the public aquariums and what have you, because they're the larger animals. Uh, Luis Rocha mentioned that there's no real problem, no real impact around the world from the hobby and food fisheries for people collecting butterflies. But it's strange when you're in the wild, there's always about the same number of larger butterfly fishes as there are smaller ones. Seems odd to people, but they have a very quick replacement rate in the wild. So to tell you that fishes look different at nighttime, as you divers know, this is a endemic butterfly, the blue line butterfly in Hawaii. This one during the daytime. And here's one at nighttime saying, leave me alone, I'm trying to get some rest. It's on the bottom. 
And what you can do, really, you can literally just go with like a flashlight on your head and pick the thing up. That's it, that's $5, oh, $8, what have you. So I've said this a couple of times already. Uh, the people in the industry, I strongly encourage them, the folks who are intermediaries between collectors, the wholesalers, the distributors, the jobbers, uh, the different terminology used depending on how much time and how much care the people have uh, with the animals uh, on, on their hands, that they actually uh, learn to feed the animals a high quality food that won't result in fouling the bag when the things are ultimately shipped. For hobbyists, I can't encourage you enough. When you get this animals, it's paramount that they uh, be fed and start feeding immediately. There's a lot of little tricks to doing this. Believe it or not, black worms, like Tubifex worms, the animals generally eat with uh, gusto. And uh, things uh, like blood worms, the carinomid, or sewer worm larvae, that sort of thing, uh, butterflies will eat, even though, of course, they're foreign to them. A very easy trick with butterfly fishes and uh, angel fishes is to open a, a bivalve, a, a mussel, a clam that's not frozen, of course, and set it on the bottom. There's, for whatever reason, uh, they're very attractive to those uh, families of fishes. Not oh, going the wrong direction. No? Okay. And so people have hopefully gotten bummed out and they're going to go home and turn their tanks into guinea pig raceways. Don't do it. I'll be lonely here talking on a podium by myself. So uh, to tell you, don't despair. There are actually, when I asked you how long you had your butterfly fishes, there are uh, some species that historically are better survivors. And once again, this is a statistical type statement. You know, the average or mean, uh, one measure of central tendency uh, of species that live longer than others. And just as an example, these are two butterflies from the Red Sea, the golden or blue mask butterfly and the uh, larvatus butterfly. This one actually, even though it's kind of expensive here, is not very much money in uh, Europe. And this one is, not, is expensive in most places and rarely lives, unfortunately. But it's an example of both. And so to tell you, uh, there's, everybody has their own sliding scale uh, describing uh, the likelihood that livestock will live uh, in captivity. And, uh, you know, I have my own, and this is just a disclaimer, saying that if you read other people's uh, works, you'll see sometimes they have a differing opinion, a different uh, a scale, uh, one way or the other. I have a real simple one. It's just uh, uh, a counting uh, number of one, two, and three. The ones, like you're not number three, you're not number two. The number one, so like everybody wants to be number one. There we are. Um, they're the best. They're the animals that on average, not all of them, but on average will live three months or more in captivity. It may not seem like very long, but it's better than the numbers two and three. The number two specimens, if you handled tens of thousands of them, really generally only live between uh, one month and three months. There's some seats over here, you young people. Don't be shy. Yeah? Oh, there's some toilet paper stuck on your foot. No, don't. I'm only, I'm only, only joking. This way, no throwing fruit. The, and then the number threes are the worst. The number threes really shouldn't be sold at all. Are there some people in this room that think that they're very old in the hobby and trade? Yeah, they've been around for 10, 20, 30 years. Who's ever sold or bought a miscellaneous butterfly? Miscellaneous? What is that? Ketodon miscellanei? I don't know. But those ones are generally, like you say, the number threes. The ones that they're, they're not going to make it. So are you with me with this, uh, this uh, system thus far? So we'll finally get to some colored pictures. People like those. So I will show you some examples of number ones. These aren't all of them. There's a few dozen. Uh, you can find a list of them on what web media, on some articles. And uh, other books by, uh, for instance, Scott Michael, uh, Jerry Allen, and Roger Steen 
Uh, there are butterfly and angel fish books from the 70s, which Hans Havas helped do the rating on. They're not aquarist. But uh, there actually are two uh, raccoon butterflies. There's the one from uh, the Pacific and one actually from the Red Sea. They're uh, uh, both actually uh, very hardy. They're both number ones. Pardon me? Yeah, the Ariga butterfly. Again, uh, there's an uh, Indo-Pacific species. And uh, then one here that has a, a, a spot on the dorsal that's from the Red Sea. And the Red Sea animals, I swear I didn't Photoshop the images. They're just that much more colorful. The people say, why is it called the Red Sea, blah, blah, blah. Uh, what happened? Well, the story is that this uh, uh, maker, God, had a bunch of civil servants and called the angels. And at the end of the week of making the, the universe, there were lazy civil servants, and they had a bunch of paint left over, so they kicked it over into the Red Sea. And so that's where we ended up with much more colorful life uh, from there. And then my favorite, I wish Lemon T. Kai had made it, uh, knucklehead. He's only like 23. I wish I was that sharp. The long and short of it, there's a subgenus. Everybody knows like they have a dog, Conus domesticus, or Phalus domesticus, a cat. Well. Believe it or not, between the species name and the genus name, sometimes they, the, there's a split again, uh, and that is a name that goes in between the genus, in this case, Ketodon, and the species name. It's called a subgenus. And that subgenus is Roops. It's called R O A O P S. Uh, and really, it should be like Expensivo instead of Roops. <laughs> Unfortunately, this fishes are almost always found below 30 meters of depth. Uh, sometimes 35, 40 meters. So it, you cannot spend as much time as a collector collecting them, even though some of them, I swear, you can collect even without a net. Just the same as Louis says, uh, talk, they don't see divers. So they're like, what's that? You know, and they just kind of swim right up to you. Uh, but the six species of Roops uh, uh, are gorgeous animals, and they're the most hardy butterfly fishes. And something I should tell you about most of the number one butterflies, I should have mentioned it, they are general omnivores. They're, for the most part, zooplanktivores. They don't eat corals, or what hobbyists call corals, you know, this polyp form life. There's three of the other species, a baby Flavicornatus and Mitratus. And there's your fish there, Dana, the Tinkeri, the Hawaii one there on the bottom right. Gorgeous, eh? And that's not all. There's other uh, number one butterflies from the animan seed, the calare butterfly, the didalma, which is the metal, oops, the metal butterfly here on the right. It's uh, from southern Japan. Some other ones, the dicasatus and the falcula. One of my favorite butterfly fishes from Hawaii, especially the Klein's butterfly. And the melanotus. I should warn everybody, there are some bunk butterflies that are very similar appearing, very similar. Now the deal is they don't come from the same area. So if you buy livestock who your dealer in turn buys from places like Quality Marine, not to give them a plug, uh, they put on their label where that specimen hailed from, where it actually was collected. Pretty interesting. Number 10s, and again another Hawaiian, the Miliaris. The Pauca fasciata from the Red Sea in the dot dash butterfly we call, Punctato fasciata. And so before people really uh, jump up and leave saying, that's it, I don't have those butterflies, I have these, uh, these other ones, what happened? Uh, it turns out some of the real popular uh, butterfly fishes, like the long nosed butterflies of the uh, forcipiger, the yellow, the flavissimus, and longirostris, they and Chelmans and the genus Chelmanops, which are mainly Australian, we don't see them too much here in the West. The Pronothodes, which are pretty common like in the tropical West Atlantic, uh, they don't get a ranking of number one. Most all of those ones don't live on average any more than one, two, three months in captivity. So you probably are making more of a, a gamble buying those other genera, those other species. Uh, but of course, there are ones that have been kept in captivity 
for decades of those, but they were kept in large systems, they were uncrowded without aggressive tank mates and made sure they were feeding. Yeah. So just to tease you, to show you some of the pictures, they're not all good looking, but a lot of the coralivore number two and number three rated butterflies uh, are just gorgeous. Uh, they're, they're really uh, good looking and they're plentiful. They're not hard to catch uh, one way or the other. But unfortunately, like I say, just uh, the, 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 the cards are stacked against you and trying to keep them. Uh, Bennett's and the, lem the melon butterfly, uh, uh, very nice animals. Very often sold as miscellaneous butterflies. Here are some of them. Uh, the Myers and the uh, eight uh, line butterfly. Uh, another heartbreak from Hawaii, the ornatissimus butterfly. Still, oh no, I think it got left off the clean list. Isn't that right? Yeah. It's not one of the ones allowed to be shipped from there. Even though they do allow the, uh, the Unimaculatus, the teardrop butterfly, which does not live very well in captivity. The Plebeus, again, sold way too commonly, doesn't live. So what is one of the, the principal things you want to do as a, a hobbyist, putting down your hard-earned dollars to buy livestock? You want to run the acid test past that specimen that you're going to buy, whether it's one of the ones that Bob the fishman said probably won't live or not. And so what is that acid test? What is this? Complete the sentence as if I was Alex Trebek. An animal that uh, eats is an animal that lives. Who said poops? Ah. <laughs> this is your kids. I hope your roommates aren't here. Uh, sheesh. Anyway, that's true too, uh, though, I guess. But the long and short of it is, uh, you want to, of course, have the thing fed in front of you. And fed what? The types of food you're able to get and probably going to offer. And if the animal doesn't eat, guess what? Don't buy it. At least not with the, the hopes that it's going to live later. It probably will not. Okay. Uh, what also to look out for when you're selecting for uh, specimens, now that you know the right species to buy, the ones that are too darn skinny. You want a robust one like me. There's a high index of fitness, you know, dividing the girth into the length, that sort of thing. In particular, you want to always avoid not just butterflies, but fishes that are thin, not just in the belly, but in the flank, up above the eyes here in the head. When the, they've been starved for so long that they're resorbing the protein from their, their bodies, that is a very bad sign probably won't resume feeding. So sometimes I tell people they really should use the isolation system. You can call it what you want, a quarantine system or not. But a lot of groups of uh, organisms we keep, it's better to expedite their placement to the main display system, including butterflies and, as you might guess, all these things like uh, gobies and blennies and their relatives, like dart fishes one way or the other. Among other reasons, why? Because they've been starved for so long, the likelihood that they're forestalled going into a system that's more stable, where there's perhaps more food from a refugium, from live rock, what have you, is more deleterious than not expediting them. It's better to take the risk of introducing a pathogen, what have you, a disease-causing organism, than to just move them ahead, perhaps through a preventative dip or bath. Again, I mentioned the tubifacids. Those are good to use, especially if you have to poop. That's it. And a plug. Uh, there are some people that, uh, well, we get a lot of questions on uh, the internet from people whose animals are having trouble. And I invariably encourage them, especially if they're marine organisms versus fresh, to add vitamins and certain types of supplements like hoofas, the highly unsaturated fatty acids. I see you two looking at each other down there. The long and short of it is uh, this thing has a discernibly positive effect. And especially the people here who are going to the party later, who are going to be drinking alcohol, you really want to be taking the vitamins. It's a very worthwhile. And uh, for marine organisms, 
It's just like the question when you're out and, uh, and the people are going, you're drinking like a fish. What do you want to say? Is that fresh water or salt water? Of course, because the freshwater fish is they're not drinking. Right? Their bodies are uh, more uh, 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 osmotically uh, dense than the environment around them. I was going to say more, you know, whatever, but I know Bingman was in the audience. So the long and short of it is uh, the marine organisms do drink their environment. So if there are uh, substances in the water uh, that are of use to them, uh, they will be getting them inside their bodies. And some of the, the basics, but especially if you haven't done this very long and you don't know what a good specimen looks like, good idea to have somebody from the club, uh, is that Myron Roth? Or bring Myron Roth out with you to look to see what a damaged and healthy specimen look like. The guru who can go with you, who will know uh, what to look for and what to look out for. And almost, this uh, pertains actually to all uh, um, uh, fishes, but the reddening, especially at the base of the fins, uh, broken fin rays, in particular the, the hard or, or spiny portions of the uh, fins, the dorsal and anal fin in particular, are trouble. And this raccoon butterfly has all sorts of issues. Among other things, butterfly fishes very commonly have uh, trematodes. They have flukes when they're shipped from the wild. And it's easy to get rid of the flukes. There's a current movement actually to try to get the people in the trade to preventatively, I didn't say prophylactically, and get a big laugh but preventatively treat all newly collected, wild collected specimens to knock off all external troubles. So using an anthelminthic like uh, praziquantel, levemisol, what have you, can get rid of this little white blotchy spots, which are probably trematodes. But for you as a consumer, by and large, if they have another specimen that is cleaner, that's the one you want. And so, uh, you know, the, the usual uh, uh, issue and, and how, who's going to uh, be able to make the best decision, uh, actually the person at every level who's handling uh, the animals. As I say, I entreat the people in the trade who are in the audience, what have you, and we'll, who will see this uh, video, probably production, a DVD, after I'm long dead, uh, to uh, select the right size bag. Don't undersize the bag. The animals should be able to turn around uh, in the bag. It should have enough water, certainly a bunch of oxygen to, as a, an anesthetic uh, to make it uh, slow down. This is a question that people go, oh, but I want to be like uh, Moses. Oh, great. I want to be like Moses and have uh, two of everything. Or maybe who knows what, menage a trois, you want to have three. Uh, of something, and so maybe the dealer you're dealing with even gives you a little bit of a break. If you're buying more, by and large, you don't want to buy pairs of these things unless you're absolutely sure they're a pair. And it's very, it really is very hard to do so. The schooling species of butterflies, the, the two most uh, common species of poor man's Moorish idols or Heniochus, uh, the Difrutes and Acuminatus, the they live in large groups and shoals in the wild. So they have to be kept in a very large system. Again, at least a couple hundred gallons. And if you have more than one, and usually small odd numbers, three, five, seven individuals, they tend to that way not to want the one pick on just the other one. It can diffuse some of the, uh, the aggression between all the specimens. And never to uh, put uh, two of the same individuals in a very small system. They will pick on each other. The people who have had great success, the public aquariums that I mentioned, they've had the butterflies in very large systems. In fact, uh, is Fernando Nostropar here? You guys have had those sky butterflies for how long? 15 years down at the Birch Aquarium? Yeah, if the folks didn't get to go down and visit us here in San Diego. Yeah, and it's sort of like Gold, uh, Goldie, Goldie, Goldie Hahn? No. Goldilocks and the three bears, you don't want to start with specimens that are too little or too big, but ones that are like porridge, just right. And ju by just right, what size is that? It's kind of smallish to medium. And what this means in terms of overall length is like uh, no smaller than two and a half inches long. 
The itty bitty ones, again, they starve before they're shipped and they just don't adapt to captivity. And the real big ones, they're too set in their ways. I don't care. The only way you can get me to eat Brussels sprouts is to put it on my pepperoni pizza. I'll just admit it. That's it. Uh, I'm just not going to eat them. That's it. They're little cabbages. The long and short of it is the big ones, likewise, they don't like being collected. So they're very expensive for the institutions when they buy them. They probably got their sky butterflies by driving a boat down to Benito or uh, Guadalupe Island, what have you. And then they collect them pretty big. They weren't tiny when they brought them up. But the, you and I as mere mortals, you want to uh, buy the ones that are medium size. And how do you tell what it's medium size? You have to look it up on the internet. You bring your guru with you from the, uh, the club. Uh, or you go online if you're a high tech uh, person and uh, find out how big the thing gets and don't buy it ever more than about half the size of the usual maximum size. Not the maximum maximum size, the one foot long butterfly, that's a big butterfly. The usual maximum size of a butterfly that's a foot long would probably only be about six, seven inches. So more, no more than three and a half, four inches. And again, uh, don't give up just because the things listed as only eating live coral polyps. Uh, there are ways to induce uh, those animals to feed. And again, if your dealer already has a thing eating prepared foods, the job is just about done. You don't have to worry. Uh, very important, I would feed small amounts more frequently. Uh, if you can, having a very large uh, refugium with a DSB, uh, what have you, to culture uh, your own foodstuffs, having it on a reverse daylight photo period, so the, the life is coming out in the dark phase, just like going on those, those manna ray feeds, and put, people put the lights out at nighttime, and the uh, uh, organisms come out of the substrate, and uh, yummy, the manna's come uh, flying by and sucking them down. The same thing, by having the ver reverse daylight photo period on your living sump, it'll make the, the foods come out, and your pump will pick them up and jettison them into the main system where they can be picked up. And so the same deal, how old am I? I can remember when you couldn't keep freshwater angelfish alive and no way with discus. So the, the things change, right? And so it used to be even this uh, a copper banded butterfly, the Chumman restrata, is that people couldn't keep that alive. And now you can see, for instance, here's one being hand fed. So don't always just say automatically, that's it. I'm not trying these things. I mentioned before, all uh, butterflies are currently wild collected. They have a kind of a weird larval stage that's just pe uh, peculiar uh, to the family called the tholichthys. Sort of looks like beetle, the guy Beetlejuice with the little spikes kind of sticking out of it when it's real small. Kind of a handy thing to be a, a real spiky little non-mouthful when you're floating up in the upper water column before you settle. Uh, and the same old problem, maybe you can get the things to uh, produce gametes, uh, sex cells, not very hard to do actually, uh, but getting the, the settled larvae after the yolk sac is resorbed to feed on whatever you can produce in adequate numbers to where it actually gains weight and uh, develops into a, 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 a little larger individual, that is almost always a, uh, a trial. So, and I mentioned the uh, post settled larvae. Do people actually use cheesecloth? Like uh, sometimes you use yourself for making things in the kitchen. They set it on the bottom and put a chemical in it. A lot of like the chemical we used to use in suntan oil, PABA, paraimmunobutyric acid. And this actually is a, is a signal releaser for fishes. They develop up to a certain stage and they smell the substrate, in particular some algae that produce this uh, PABA compound. And they go, oh, we're near shallow water and they develop and swim down, right? You don't want to swim down in most of the oceans. How deep do you think the ocean actually is? If you took all the solids on this planet and smoothed them out, how deep would the water be above the whole planet? A little under two miles. Yeah, more than 10,000 feet. There's a lot of water on the planet. Uh, most of it's seawater, of course, and most of it really deep. So if you're an organism that lives along the shoreline, you want to be able, once you've are developing to be able to tell that you're near the shoreline. So anyway, they put this cheesecloth down with the pop on it, the animals come down and they wiggled into this thing and then ho ho, next morning, Jacques, 
gets up, has his croissant, and uh, goes and collects the uh, cheesecloth and then shakes out this larvae, and oh, big sale day. And disease treatments, uh, again, to tell people, is it better to avoid the disease than actually uh, treat it? Uh, my favorite, as a, uh, poor Myron Roth knows, is uh, using uh, fresh water, uh, baths, uh, or dips. And the dips just a shorter duration uh, bath. And sometimes use adjuncts. I'm a strong advocate of using formalin if it's available and legal in uh, your town and state. It's not actually in California. Uh, but uh, there are other things you can add to the water, methylene blue, what have you, uh, that help. And these two, by the way, are uh, covered in articles and books I've been lucky enough to pen. So, and uh, the deal, like I say, this is a little lesson for the people who are in the trade. Please leave the animals in your care for a, a reasonable amount of time. That amount of time might be as short as a week. It might be more than a week. And yeah, I know you're not going to make as much money, uh, but having the animals rest up for a while uh, really makes a huge difference. You may know this, by the way. The hobby loses about 100% of its customer base every year. It breaks my heart to tell you that more aquariums are in storage, like in attics and basements, than are actually set up. It really bums me out. Please don't leave. Don't leave the hobby, especially not if it's just for lack of useful, actionable information. There's many people here who gladly will help you, uh, and you can uh, source uh, their help on the internet even very readily. But also, why do people leave? Anomalous losses. They lose their livestock. And there's lots and lots of reasons for this. There's the founder effect, where the collectors don't know what the wholesalers know, or the distributors don't know, that the retailers don't know, that the end user, we do know. If the people knew all these things, they wouldn't collect a lot of the species and specimens that, they, that do get collected. Because they, they would realize they're not going to live. It makes no sense. Unless you're Delta Airlines. I hope nobody hears from Air Freight. OK. Disease treatments. Do I have any more time? I'm not out of time, am I? Oh, yes, I am. OK, so just to tell people very quickly then, uh, you want to avoid long-term copper exposure on butterflies and some other families of fishes, like uh, angel fishes. It ends up poisoning them, they become, become anosmotic, and then stop feeding. And that's it. We'll open the floor to questions, but first, a big applause.